Or do you want me here? Want me to be in the middle and then <laughs> at least space it out? Probably. Probably do that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center on the road. <laughs> yeah. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center, which is, as some of you know, a nonpartisan nonprofit created by the US Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people. And today we are so honored to be here at Stanford Law School, the cradle of free speech in a digital age to discuss one of the most important questions facing democracies around the world, that is the problem of digital disinformation. Our conversation today is part of an exciting national commission that the National Constitution Center has established that wants to ask, what would the framers of the US Constitution, Madison and Hamilton and the others, have made of American democracy today, and how can we resurrect their values in a digital world? Madison said in Federalist 55, even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. And he meant by that that large groups, when they deliberate face to face, are likely to be guided by passion rather than reason. Madison and the framers created the US constitutional system to prevent the direct expression of populist passion and to slow down deliberation so that majorities could only coalesce slowly and over time. There have been many changes over the past 200 years that have undermined the framers' conception of a representative republic, bless you, rather than a direct uh, democracy, including changes in the party system, in the presidency and Congress. But we're here today to discuss the most urgent question of the uh, free speech side, and that is the role of new social media platforms in contributing to the speeding up of public dialogue so that we are clustering ourselves into filter bubbles and echo chambers. We're in danger of being misled by digital disinformation and the passion rather than reason that the framers feared is rampant. We have the most distinguished representatives of America's leading social media platforms to discuss this urgently important question. We're gonna ask them is digital disinformation a serious problem? And then we're gonna to begin to dig in on solutions. Are there technological, regulatory, or other solutions that could slow down deliberation and combat the problem of digital disinformation? Um, I'm gonna introduce our speakers, uh, but first I have to thank the Stanton Foundation for having funded and supported this free speech debate as well as a series of free speech debates around the country. And I have to thank you, the audience, for coming and saying we're gonna ask you to vote before and after the debate on the question under consideration, and the question is, does digital disinformation pose a threat to democracy? And we'll vote before, and you'll listen carefully to the arguments, and then we'll vote again after, and uh, we'll see if anyone has changed his or her minds based on the arguments. So I think uh, that I'm going to ask you now, using these incredibly techno-savvy clickers in front of you, to vote on this question, and I wanna make sure that I have it right. And the question is, is digital, dis is digital disinformation undermining democracy? And approach this question with an open mind. Separate your political views from your constitutional views and be guided by reason rather than passion in your votes and then listen to the arguments on both sides. All right, thank you for voting. And as you do so, I'm now gonna introduce our panelists. Oh, oh we're not, we haven't voted yet. Oh, here, there's this very important uh, series of instructions. Turn on your device, press the on or off button. If you don't see it, press search again, use the arrow keys. Is, is the, see, the voting procedure itself is being undermined by <laughs> digital democracy. I'm gonna rely on you to figure out how to vote as I'm doing the introductions. And once you've voted, press send to submit your final answer and the d device will display your answer back. <laughs> And then one of those false. And if you can't <laughs> vote, then you can vote afterward. That's also another <laughs> wonderful <laughs> benefit. Oh, that's a good, Larry, what an excellent 18th century wow. solution. Thank you so analog. much. Gary Lauder channeling James Madison asks for a show of hands. Who believes that digital disinformation is undermining democracy? And who believes it is not? All right, wonderful. That was about, uh, not quite a, uh, I'd say about 80% to 20%. Let's see if people have changed their minds after. Here's for hands rather than uh, clickers. All right, um, our moderator, Larry Kramer, the dean of Stanford Law, may or may not appear. Uh, the traffic is bad. Juniper Downs, uh, who's our great panelist, 
uh, who is Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at YouTube, is also caught in traffic and uh, may be joining us. But in the meantime, we're extraordinarily fortunate to have uh, before us uh, Elliot Schrag, who is Vice President of Communications and Public Policy at Facebook, Nate Persley, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law, and Nick Pickles, the Senior Public po Policy Strategist at Facebook. At Twitter. Wait, no, Twitter. At Twitter, I'm sorry. <laughs> you may switch positions after the debate, <laughs> just as our audience, depending on how things go. There's a lot of movement between the tech firms. It's really hard to keep track. <laughs> Nick has just returned from the UK, and we're delighted to welcome here in this incredibly important position. So Elliot, let's just jump right into the uh, central question. Um, is digital disinformation undermining democracy and in what ways? And Facebook has experienced uh, an extraordinary national debate on this question, so you, uh, your thoughts would be wonderful. Sure. Well, first, thanks for, for, for having having me and having us. It's the, the issue of digital disinformation is is an important and 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 you know central one. I, I want to distinguish though, and and perhaps it's it's appropriate to start in, in context. The idea of Disinformation is nothing new in political discourse, and uh, democracy has always had uh, challenges with the free flow of information and the content of information. And so I, I would say first and foremost, as we look at the re-emergence re of uh, disinformation in this new forum, uh, we should not be surprised that the same benefits and risks resurface in different ways. So for me, the question is not, is digital disin is, is disinformation something that exists in the digital sphere? Of course it does, just like information exists in the digital sphere. So the challenge that we, we face, and certainly we face as a company, is how do you make sure, how do you, what steps do you take to, to, to facilitate the free flow of information that contributes to a healthy and vibrant democracy while installing protections that reduce the likelihood of, uh, of, of the distribution of information that is manipulative, exploitative, or fraudulent. And so from my perspective, the question isn't does it happen, it's how do you manage it? And I think it's absolutely fair to say that, that all of us in the digital sphere, and, and particularly Facebook, uh, have a long way to go uh, in, in doing a better job to, to strike that balance. Uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that you know, the, the tools that exist now enable a level of political discourse that have ne has never existed before. And I think that's a good thing, that candidates have the ability to reach uh, audiences and constituencies, that citizens have the ability to find other citizens with common interests and, and objectives, uh, that elected officials have new ways of reaching their constituents, and the constituents have new ways of reaching their elected officials. That's the good side. Um, I think what we've seen over the past couple of years is that uh, there have been deliberate efforts to corrupt that process, whether it's economically motivated, where people use tools like ours to make money by uh, fueling the spread of false or inaccurate information, you know, in the same way that, you know, uh, uh, political disinformation involves many tools that are similar to the propagation of spam. You know, to yesterday's Viagra uh, emails are today's misinformation about uh, sensationalized stories in politics. That's one segment. Another segment is the foreign interference. And we saw a concerted effort by foreign government to inject, you know, illegitimate arguments in, in the political debate in the United States. And, and we were not uh, sufficiently equipped to respond in a, in a, in a fast manner. Um, so we have a whole, and again, I don't want to you know, filibuster, but our responsibility as a platform is to remove content that's not appropriate, reduce the distribution of content that is inaccurate or propaganda or misinformation, and inform people so that they can make informed choices uh, as part of the democratic process. And I won't do it now, but at various points later on, I'd love to go into the details of, of what are the steps we're taking for each of reduction, removal, and, uh, and inform. Uh, 
Thank you for laying the problem out so well, and we'd love to dig into each of those questions. As you suggest, the different platforms face different forms of spreading digital disinformation. Nick, uh, the National Constitution Center is nonpartisan uh, by charter, um, but I can say with confidence and nonpartisan neutrality that the idea of tweeting presidents would have alarmed the framers because they thought that presidents and representatives should never communicate directly with their constituents. Federalist 10 says that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. What, and, and ladies and gentlemen, meet the great Larry Kramer. <laughs> Five thirty. There's no sure, time too late for uh, digital disinformation discussion. I'm asking Nick. Uh, Elliot just <laughs> framed the pro problem extremely well, and he promised to dig into what Facebook is doing to combat digital disinformation. I'm now about to ask Nick uh, to describe the distinctive problem of dis digital disinformation on Twitter. What forms does it take, um, and do you believe it's forming a threat to democracy? And then I'll turn it over to Larry to continue that to uh, moderate. I don't know. You seem to be doing just fine. <laughs> you can I be a panelist too if you want, because your thoughts would be excellent. But uh, Nate, Nate. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for welcoming, welcoming a Brit to this um, incredibly important conversation. There's some constitutional issues between our two countries uh, in the past, uh, but hopefully we can put that to one side. Uh, and move on. uh, particularly if we're discussing democracy, there's only two countries in the world that still have uh, people writing their laws uh, who, are, who occupy a position in the legislature uh, on birthright, which is the United Kingdom and Lesotho. So um, in terms of when we're thinking about democracies, they take different shapes and different forms around the world. Um, and it's incredibly important that um, as we're trying to think about policy solutions, we also bear in mind that the policy solutions work differently in different places. And that's one of the things that, that we've certainly seen um, at Twitter is firstly, the, in, even internationally, the actors and the, the methods are different in different parts of the world. Um, the sophistication is different. And the solutions required are different. Um, as Elliot says, we certainly saw uh, the, the bot problem, um, the use of automation in some cases to try and manipulate things like trending topics, in other cases to try and give a, a false degree of credibility through increased numbers, whether it's retweets or uh, the number of people following an account, which gives a, a misleading impression of credibility and authority. Um, now, actually, when you have that credibility, the question of whether it's disinformation, hyperpartisan, malinformation actually has become secondary because you have the credibility to spread whatever message that you're spreading. So one of the, um, the things that I think we think a lot about is firstly, we have to work a lot harder to make sure our platforms aren't being manipulated to give that artificial credibility even before the content's gone out. Because actually the most important thing when a user looks at an account is can they make an informed decision about the quality and the credibility and the authenticity of that account if it has a huge number of followers that are not real people, then that gives you a false impression of credibility. So from our point of view, you know, we're suspending um, huge numbers of accounts for these reasons. Uh, we challenge upwards of 6.4 million accounts every week uh, for being suspicious. That's challenging. Many of those turn out to be real people, uh, but they may be very active. Uh, and we're also aggressively stopping people using our open API. Twitter's an open platform. You can build apps to retweet things, to build a way of putting uh, tweets into other apps. They were also used to uh, automate engagement. So we took actually a choice which, today's World Press Freedom Day, and we took a decision on our API to limit the use of multiple accounts to share information. That hurt newsrooms, because many newsrooms had those tools in place so that they could sh share art across um, multiple accounts in real time, we actually also saw a 90% reduction in the amount of malicious automation through TweetDeck as a result of that change. So there was a trade-off there. I think that's the point that, that I hope we can get to today is so many of the policy responses, either at a technological level, a legal level, a policy level, have trade-offs. And one of the things I think that if, if you look at the, the Economist Intelligence Unit's report tracking democracy, the one trend they cited last year about the threats to democracy was limiting free expression and limiting freedom of the press. And that was one of the key reasons why uh, we actually have fewer democracies than we did two years ago. It's because people have reduced that freedom of speech. So there's a huge trade-off at the heart of this, but as Elliot says, our industry was too slow to wake up to this threat, um, and we were too slow to get to the complexity of it. But I think now uh, the challenge is 
as we've seen in other areas, as we squeeze the problem, it moves to other places. And sometimes those other places are less equipped than we are to deal with the problem. So the problem sometimes gets worse. We need to be conscious of that as an industry more broadly. Thanks so much for that. Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you to set up the question for Nate. You have commissioned uh, Nate and other scholars to address this question. So why don't you ask Nate what you'd like about whether digital disinformation is a threat to American democracy. Larry Kramer, in addition to being the former dean of Stanford Law School and the head of the Hewlett Foundation, is one of America's most distinguished scholars of Madisonian democracy and uniquely well qualified to moderate this panel. Thanks, Jeff. I'm, I'm at his board, so he has to say stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, well, I'll just put the question in it, although let me put it a little more sharply, right, and both more generally and more sharply, which is to what extent do you see the problem of digital disinformation as a significant threat to the continuance of democracy? So not with respect to any particular company, we can get to that later, or even platforms in particular, but just a broader problem of, of disinformation. So... Uh, as Elliot said, or and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, you know, fake news is as old as news, right? Hate speech is as old as speech. Uh, there are sources of disinformation in the information ecosystem, um, and the internet is one of those. What I try to focus on in my research uh, is what is unique about the internet that makes it a threat to democracy, uh, and part of it is the relationship to the spreading of disinformation. So it's not clear that a basic tenet of First Amendment law that the marketplace of ideas is the best test for truth. It's not clear that that's ever been true, but it's certainly not true in the digital age. All right? It is not the case that the more speech that there is out there, the more likely that truth is going to win out. That doesn't mean you then opt for censorship because there's all kinds of other collateral damage that comes from that and for you know, picking winners and losers in the information uh, marketplace. But we shouldn't uh, sort of cleave ourselves to that uh, age-old notion that just because you have more and more speech uh, that you're going to end up having uh, the truth win out. Now, what is it about the digital information ecosystem that I think poses a threat to democracy? And there are sort of several unique phenomena. Uh, and again, it's not fake news. It's not about uh, the, the capacity of human beings to lie. But it's the speed at which information travels, right? And so that it's uh, much quicker online, of course. Uh, it's the fact that it's unmediated. Right? And, and as you began with sort of Madisonianism um, and the, the sort of uh, views of the framers that there should be some control on uh, or some boundaries set on uh, political debate. And you know the, the, inf the digital information ecosystem does not have uh, Walter Cronkite to tell you that's just the way it is at the end of the night, right? Uh, there are no uh, referees uh, like that, that that set the boundaries of political debate. And when there were referees like that, um, you know, they excluded all kinds of political conversations that we probably would see as, as valuable, uh, even if they weren't part of the mainstream at the time. So it's velocity, right, the speed of information, it's virality, the fact that it's information that's, that's transmitted peer to peer. Uh, and it's also volume, right, the sheer amount of information that then is what gives these platforms their power, which is that they, the decisions that they make about how to curate information become critical in uh, determining what you know, people, uh, where, where their attention lies. Related to those phenomena, though, uh, again, a, a unique features of the digital information infrastructure um, is anonymity, right? Uh, Nick talked a little bit about bots and about the capacity for machines, in a sense, to impersonate humans, millions of them, uh, on Twitter. Facebook has had to deal with this. YouTube, when Juniper Downs comes here, uh, they're having to deal with this as well. But the anonymity problem, right, is what gives us the bot problem, and it gives us the hate speech problem online. So uh, the bot problem, right, is the ability of computers, essentially, to mimic human beings online, and they're going to get better and better at it. Now, most of the bot problem uh, uh, is not really about that that computer trying to imitate someone to persuade you, but it's about manipulating search rankings. It's about trying to send certain types of information uh, over others. But if you think that a democracy, in part, is about um, the conversation being limited to the citizenry, who are human, right? We're now in a situation where the political conversation can be sent in from outside the country by state actors or trolls or the like, and it can be done by non-humans as well. 
None of these are the kinds of phenomena that the framers were thinking of, right? I mean, they were thinking about foreign intervention, let's be clear, right? Hamilton, uh, 68, and the like. Um, but, uh, you know, if you, you asked, you know, James Madison, well, what happens if the president retweets a bot, right? Which our president has done over 150 times. Uh, you know, that, that, that was not on the, on the radar screen at the time. Well, there weren't radar screens at the time, but you know, <laughs> had there been. Right? And so, and so those, those features, as well as, again, the, 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 the sovereignty question, uh, not just of Russian disinformation coming over, uh, say, into, in the United States, but also the power of these platforms, right, as multinational uh, institutions to really set the terms for speech and debate across the world, right, is something that was never conceived of before. Uh, and we should know, I mean, and, and because we're talking about democracy writ large, not just American democracy, that the Europeans see these firms, right, as extensions of American influence and culture, right, and extensions of Americans' view on speech, right, which is not necessarily the same in, in Europe. And we, the U.S. has a particular view of speech. Uh, and, and it may be that the Europeans are going to be the tag, uh, the, the, the tail that wags the American dog here, right? That their laws um, holding these firms liable, their laws on privacy are going to be the ones that have uh, spillover effects in the U.S. All right, let me, I, I'm going to actually switch hats a little and do not just moderation because I do want to push this question a little farther. Those are all true and still didn't answer the question, actually, <laughs> right? Which is because I think it's important as we move to the next phase, which is what to do about it, that we have a real assessment of what the scope of the threat is. So I'll say the following, yes. The, the short answer is we don't know, uh, which is so we I'm going to take the, a stronger the, the, position. The, the, the size I'm, I'm going to take a stronger position because yeah. I think we have actually an awful lot to learn from history here. And there are three features of the current situation that I think are distinctive and worth noting. So one is the political polarization that we deal with now is not ideological, is not just ideological. It's not just disagreement around ideas. It's what political scientists call affective polarization, which is to say it's much more tribal. It's much more the position I take is because you take the opposite position. 94% of Americans can support background checks for guns and you still don't get the legislation because Republicans are not gonna support it if Democrats do and vice versa. All right, and, and the, the tribal disagreement creates a different kind of dynamic, that's one. A second difference, which I think is really worth noting, is the nature of our democracy is actually quite different. We are actually way more democratic than we used to be. So that we could have a world in which the public were being exposed to misinformation and disinformation. I mean, you read the newspapers of the 1790s and the early 19th century, and they make everything that we're doing today quite tame by comparison in truth. But it didn't really matter because the fact of the matter was people could believe crazy things and they were still going to defer to the elites at the end of the day. And the elites operated differently. And that is not our world any longer. The third difference that I think is worth noting is the scope of exposure. Uh, in, in, at the time of the founding, in your entire life, you would not get exposed to newspapers equal to one edition of the Sunday Times. Right? So the amount of information that is out there and the numbers of people who are getting exposed to it is vastly different. And, and not only is it true in terms of volume, but it's also true in terms of the nature of it. Because prior to the, or, or, to the internet, the information that people got was mediated through the distribution outlets. So the production and distribution outlets were pretty much confined, which meant vast majority of people got their news either through one of these three major news networks or major newspapers, broadcast networks, all of whom curated and didn't let through the crazy. The crazy stuff was still out there. It just didn't reach audiences like what, like what we're getting today. And it's not fake news we're worried about, but propaganda. And propaganda works. So we have moved into a situation in which we have a highly democratic society filled with people who are effectively polarized, getting exposed to a steady stream of propaganda. And I, I think there is more than enough history to tell us that no Republican government can survive for long under those kinds of circumstances. That was little r, just so that we're clear. <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. And, and so, the, so now the question, I don't think I want to put out whether you agree or disagree, because I don't think we need to resolve that. I just want to put that out there at least as a potential risk that we really need to be thinking about as we move to the next question, which is wherever you are in that continuum of the, by the way, um, I wish Juniper were here partly to get her. She's on her way. Yeah, I know, She's she got stuck in traffic. Partly to get her views on this and partly because I have to say I'm highly self-conscious right, exactly. about the, the makeup of this panel as it has turned out. Um, we didn't plan it that way. 
Uh, in any event, um, wherever you are on that continuum, I think the question we want to be thinking about is, did you frame this in terms of the Lincoln point? Madison, so you can make the Okay, so now. I said to Jeff, the way I wanted to frame this was Lincoln says, the Constitution is not designed to be a suicide pact. And what he meant by that is if circumstances arise in such a way that the way you have been conceptualizing and protecting civil rights actually is going to lead to the demise of the republic, you should rethink that. And, and, and I believe we are in a situation like that, but that's the question I want to put out, which is should we be rethinking norms around how we think about free speech that are not universal? They were deeply contextualized when the context has changed as much as it has, so that holding to, for instance, notions like the solution to bad speech is more speech, something that everybody always has known is not true, but that didn't matter in a context when very few people were being exposed to the bad speech. Should we rethink ideas like that put aside the question of how, but first whether we should, given the context we're in. So let me put that out to our various panelists and see what they have to say. We'll start here again with you, Elliot. Do you want to use that or is that? I'll, I'll, I'll just get started. So, so I, I, we've had this conversation yeah, before. I, I'm, I'm really, really nervous about looking at a recent phenomenon and deciding that we need to disrupt fundamental or foundational principles on which our society is based. Um, I, 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 I couldn't agree more strongly, first and foremost, with the point that Nate made. And that is that this is an area where uh, public conversation and indeed policy conversation, in my opinion, is driven more by anecdote than by data. And, and I, again, I want to acknowledge that we at Facebook have been slow in making the information on our platform available for academic research and third party <coughs> research so that we don't uh, just posit how our service is used here. Come on. Perfect. <laughs> Thank God Juniper is here <laughs> for so many reasons. <laughs> I'm here to save this from being an old man. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because even questions like, does social media contribute to polarization? Does it create echo chambers and filter bubbles? These are things that I believe are now viewed as conventional wisdom. And at least the data that I've seen suggests that at best, this is controversial. And at worst, it is wrong. Um, our responsibility as responsible actors in this debate is to help make sure that, that uh, thoughtful research can be done. It's a reason why we announced, it's a perfect opportunity to emphasize, announced a partnership with uh, the Hewlett Foundation and a bunch of other foundations to uh, make uh, our information on our, from our platform available to independent researchers. Nate is going to be, I believe, one of the people leading that effort externally, funded by them, to help make sure that, uh, that the approaches, the strategies, the tools we're using to understand the impact of our platform on elections, in particular democracy more generally, uh, is better understood, reviewed, and, 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 and incorporated into you know, the products we build. So first and foremost, let's all be cautious before we decide how this is all playing out. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a tiny example of that, there is no agreement whatsoever on the prevalence of uh, false news, propaganda, misinformation on our platform. And you know, it, it, it's, it's essentially, you know, the world today is like saying we have a crime wave because, or we're, we're, we have a crime wave because there are three crimes committed, or that we're solving the crime problem because we've made three arrests. We have no real understanding uh, on, on what the state of criminal activity is, misinformation equivalent on our platform. We need to understand that better. So I'd say that's point number one. Um, point number two is, to the extent that we are going to consider making changes and really beginning to question fundamental beliefs, I do think that we should be pretty modest and circumspect in the approaches that we take. And so, for example, and, and maybe this is actually more profound, but I would say for the purpose of a platform like ours, and I differentiate our platform from others, we've really decided to double down on two principles. One is authenticity. 
and the other is transparency. And that is to suggest that we believe that, and it goes out to, to a point that Nick made, to the extent that people can, ha, have to represent themselves as their true selves online, A, they are more likely to be, uh, uh, they're more likely, the, the evidence we've seen shows, to be more accurate in their communications. Uh, and number two, their credibility is more easily and readily assessed. Um, not doesn't eliminate all propaganda, doesn't eliminate all misinformation or false news, but it's an important step. Uh, number two is transparency. To the extent the information that circulates and distributes on the platform is transparent, that is, you understand in the case of advertising or in the case of, uh, of a news, so-called news content, who the source is, where it's come from, background information on the source, um, that and, and what other information uh, they've, they've produced, uh, that contributes tremendously to more informed understanding. And then I think third is the, the very conscious attempts that we make to the extent that we can, and we have programs with third parties, third party fact checkers to, 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 to do this, uh, that we offer uh, related perspectives, that we, dis that we reduce when information is found uh, or, or, or labeled disputed, we reduce the distribution. And when it is, when such content is distributed, uh, people are offered other perspectives so that they can make a more informed choice. Now, I, I, I again, we should talk, and I know we will, about what the role of government is. But the first line of defense for democracy is what's the, what are the appropriate actions of a responsible company? And at least at, at, at this point, my belief is that authenticity, transparency, and, and essentially and, and controls over distribution or thoughtful distribution uh, are the right first steps. Just so, just so Madison said, sure. the first line of defense in a democracy is the people, but put that aside. And I have a question for Nato, though. I realize as Juniper came in that sort of this panel is like the Constitution itself. So we started with a pretty good thing that was imperfect. I'm like the Reconstruction Amendments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the Progressive Era Amendments. Or maybe I'm the Bill of Rights and she's the Reconstruction Amendments. Or maybe you're the e ERA. I don't know. <laughs> Nate, let me put the question to you. Do you why, why don't you just ask the disinformation question to Juniper? Yes. Okay. If you yes. want to go back. So, yeah, sure. I think we yes. have a chance to hear for a little yes. bit, but I'll put you right on the spot then. The, the, the core question is, how significant is the disinformation problem as a threat to democracy? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Juniper Downs. I run policy for YouTube. Um, thank you all for having me here. I apologize for being late. Um, so I think there's a couple things to get at here. First of all, I, I think I heard Elliot saying as I was listening to the live stream sitting in traffic that disinformation has always been a problem, that information economies have always had people who are very intentionally using the platforms they have available to them to spread disinformation, oftentimes for political ends. Now, does that problem exist today in the digital era? Of course it does. And I think as, sitting here as a representative of the company, um, but the question is, what responsibility do we bear for that? We have designed these services and platforms that have really democratized how information flows globally. And there have been some serious upsides to that. And of course, there have also been some downsides. And I think we sometimes forget to look at the upsides. For example, we all know the stories of how people from countries where there are often mainstream media blackouts have been able to use online tools to expose atrocities on the ground, human rights violations, to get content out to the world that would be very hard to get out in countries that still have a lot of government control over media sources and so on. And that's, that's really been revolutionary in terms of being able to connect the world directly through people who are living experiences on the ground. Now, obviously, Obviously, um, especially as these platforms have grown, there are always going to be bad actors who are trying to exploit whatever tools are available to them toward their end. And that is where I think our responsibility comes in. So if you talk about misinformation or disinformation, obviously it exists on a spectrum, where at one end of the spectrum you have intentional bad actors. These can be you know, government actors who are engaging in, in state interference in various ways. It can be troll farms who are trying to spread disinformation and be deceptive toward end users for their own economic incentives. On that end of the spectrum, um, Google has long invested in complex tools to fight 
spammers, to fight state interference with our services, and so on, and to take really severe action. Then in the middle, you might have, um, say, opinion vloggers, people who are opining about current events, giving their own perspectives. These things can be filled with what I think everyone in this room would agree is counterfactual information, but um, this is a part of a robust public discourse that people can challenge well-accepted fact. And so I think that how we handle that is a lot trickier, and the way we think of this is really uh, about quality of information. So for example, if people are coming to our services clearly looking for news content, those kinds of websites or YouTube channels are not likely to be what we consider news that we would surface in the top results to, that, to those users. We have a sense of what sites are legitimate news sites, what channels are legitimate news channels, and we try to promote authoritative content and demote lower quality, less authoritative content. And then of course, at, this end, at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, you have mainstream news itself, where obviously this debate around misinformation and who's responsible for kind of the, the post-fact world that many people feel we live in today, um, there's a lot of complicity in the, in the mainstream media also. I think you know, President Obama famously said, if you spend your days watching Fox News, you live in a really different reality than if you spend your days listening to NPR. So obviously, there's not a common source of facts that even mainstream media are drawing on. So um, I think it's important to, to include that in, in part of the discussion. One other thing I want to challenge um, in the conversation from the outset is the idea that our democracy, our democracy is dying. I think if you look at the history of the United States, it's a messy story, the story of this democracy. It has had peaks and valleys throughout our history, and that is actually built into the structure of our democratic institutions, where there are intentional checks and balances, intentional ways for the citizenry to challenge the republic. And that is part of the, what was set up in the, in the very um, you know, foundation of this of this country. So I was looking at some data earlier today about kind of faith in the federal government. It's really interesting to see. So, um, you know, in, according to Gallup polling, back in 1964, about three fourths of Americans trusted the federal government. By 19 um, Hold on, wrote it down. 1976, that was down to 33%. Now, we all know what happened in those intervening years. It wasn't digital media. It was actually the, the actions, arguably, of the government institutions themselves that inspired that rapid decline in trust, right? You had the Vietnam War. You had the, the late 60s, where obviously there was a lot of organizing against the government, a lot of growing distrust in traditional institutions that didn't have anything to do with um, the information and how it was shared, it had to do with actually whether people trusted the actions of their government to protect their interests. And um, I think even in recent times, we've seen quite a few instances like that where there's been a decline in trust in government because of a decline in individuals' well-being. Um, and actually, if you are curious about what that data looks like over the past 10 years through the Obama administration in the first two years of the, of the Trump administration is actually pretty level, which is interesting. It hovers between um, 19 and 25% for that entire 10-year period. Um, so we haven't seen a precipitous decline in the, in the, in the past two years, for, for those who are curious about that data. So those are some opening thoughts. So, uh, and then we had moved on, and I want to come to Nate to the question of wherever one sits on this continuum of how great you think the threat to democracy actually is. Um, how should we be thinking about dealing with it? So, so Elliot says we should, to the extent that we carefully, right, be um, be circumspect. Um, so, but of course, circumspect is in the eye of the beholder. So, I, and I wouldn't want to ask the representatives of the companies to answer a question that I can't ask you. So, but let's have a measure. So, if you think about the response of either the EU mm -hmm. and or the Germans, which are the two at least where we have actual efforts to do something about this, to regard those as circumspect or not, plausible or not, helpful or not. Give us, a, maybe say a little bit about them and give us a sense of what you think. So let's, the German fake news bill, which is actually not about fake news, but, but is a, a, a bill to deal with hate speech as well as other illegal speech, is exactly the wrong way to go about this, and, and here's why, and it's instructive for us as well. So I, I will, I will. So, so the, the German bill basically holds these folks accountable, the internet uh, intermediaries accountable for the speech that occurs on their platform, so much so that if they get a takedown, if they get notified of an illegal speech act that occurs on their platform, if they don't remove it within 24 hours, then they are fined uh, 50 million euros, 
if I got that right. It, now there are certain ex, there are certain exceptions that they'll give you about a week, and, and but the point is, if you live in an algorithmic world as these three people do, uh, the only way to deal with something like that is to have machines, you know, basically be very aggressive in taking down uh, potentially uh, problematic expression. Um, the, the reason it's a problem, I don't have a problem with different countries having different views of free speech and then, then imposing them on, on American companies or, or in the information ecosystem that they're operating in. The problem is that the government doesn't want to make the hard choices, right? So the democracies themselves don't want to have to really get involved in censoring hate speech and, and making those very difficult decisions about libel and defamation and the like. And so that has, you know, puts them, they, they, it's sort of easier just to find them instead of uh, having the government do it. Now, when you get involved and try to write these kinds of laws, right, if you wanted, if you wanted to write a fake news, as, as much as disinformation might be a problem, try yourself to sit down and write a statute that would combat that. OK, um, one thing you'll realize, by the way, is most of the stuff that you would end up regulating through a disinformation bill is not the problematic stuff that's going on, I think, on, on, on these platforms. A lot of it is at the edge of the kind of uh, propaganda that you were talking about. It's going to be extremely difficult for a government to regulate that kind of thing um, without really treading on some uh, pretty core First Amendment values uh, or free speech values as they're um, expressed elsewhere. So I think that you know these are the way the Europeans have done it are particularly difficult. Um, there are other regulations that you have in Europe dealing with privacy and the like, but I don't think you were necessarily asking about those. Um, but as I said before, why? I mean, the Europeans, right, they view these companies, which all exist within, you know, basically 50 miles of each other uh, in, in the Bay Area, as extensions of American First Amendment culture and values, right? Seen as very uh, foreign to uh, European views on free speech and the like. And so they're much, you know, they're happy to, to regulate them in, in the way that they're doing. So. Again, this is not, well, I suppose it really is part of what the conversation here is. We actually do regulate speech. Yes. And in fact, ironically, the, the codes of conduct, for us, it's our community standards. And I think the comparable community standards at, 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 at YouTube, at Google, at Twitter, are actually, ironically, much closer to the, to the standards that the Europeans would impose than what our First Amendment would, mm -hmm. would, would impose. So in fact, we really do, it, it, you know, That's when, right. when Nate says it doesn't, the, 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 the restrictions wouldn't affect the stop, topics we're discussing today, it's because our standards generally don't touch political speech, but it, it absolutely touches speech that incites violence, that promotes hate, that uh, uh, you know, it involves self-harm, all sorts of issues that, according to the First Amendment, if, 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 we were, if, if we were required to permit any content that was permissible under US law, would be a, a fundamental, you know, pornography, nudity, you know, et cetera, would be a very, very a different presentation of information. So the, the challenge is that there is this category of content, of political speech, and the question is, and this really goes to your second question, is how do we handle political speech that people find objectionable because it is either inaccurate, it is poorly or improperly motivated, uh, or it, in, in, in other ways, uh, distorts our conception of what civic and appropriate democratic discourse should look like. Can I just say one thing, just, just so I don't seem like I'm, I'm letting these firms off the hook, which is that it, what, 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 Elliot, what's that? I didn't think you were. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. I, I didn't suggest, but, but now I'm going to put you on the hook. Uh, so, 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 because Elliot's absolutely right. It's not, so there's a certain category of speech which is not allowed on the platforms, but each one of these platforms makes decisions about uh, what goes at the top and what goes at the bottom, right? And so those decisions, that's why YouTube and Facebook and Google uh, and Twitter are not the town square. Right? It's not as if it's all comers to the Boston Commons. There are decisions that have to be made as to what kind of communication occurs where in your attention span. Right? And so those are value judgments, right? sometimes motivated by engagement, sometimes motivated by uh, all these concerns about bad action. Right? And so that's another area in which you know, concerns about polarization, disinformation, and the like uh, can then feed in. 
So I want to, Nick, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this in whatever way you want. And then I actually want to, we still have some time to turn well, to Yeah, you got to be able to respond. Let, let, let Jennifer respond to me there. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, I mean, this, this idea, so I actually, the, the Knight Foundation did a really great uh, lit review on the research around echo chambers. And actually, the research did find that people who were online were exposed to more sources of information yeah. than was otherwise the case. One of the interesting challenges is that actually that there is a connection between people who are take more extreme political views, who have access to less information. They're generally speaking real world echo chambers. One of the big challenges is the way that the economy has actually moved. So in Europe, what's driven a lot of the, the discussion around immigration has been the migration crisis. Um, in the US, certainly I think I heard someone saying, it was a James Carville book, that said that the middle class basically has had a pay rise for 40 years. So the, the inequality in, in, in governments and in, in countries <laughs> drives a political response. Our platforms give people a place to express that view. They find other people who share that view. Do people exploit the fact that they feel very strongly about something? Yes, and that's where our platforms need to make sure that the exploitation isn't happening from outside the country. But the underlying social and economic issues that are there, whether it's people's views about immigration, whether it's people's views about the, 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 uh, the governing class not having their interests at heart, actually, as technology platforms, it's very dangerous for us to get in that space because either you're asking us to change the information that we provide to people based on an ideological view, which I don't think is what people want tech companies to be, um, but it's also actually getting to this place where um, the barriers to entry for the media industry are lower than they ever have been. Now, that's a good thing. It changes who the gatekeepers are. And I think this is where perhaps the German model does come up with problems, because what the German model says is that we want tech companies to decide who are the gatekeep gatekeepers, not government. And actually, it's quite interesting if you look at the debate in Germany when the law was passed to where it is now. You've got newspapers like Faz uh, and Build writing editorials saying, maybe we need to rethink this because actually the democratic norms and democratic values that we aspire to aren't embodied in this sort of legislation because ultimately, when you put the burden on companies with very large sanctions, there is a chilling effect by risk aversion. And that's something that actually is very hard, to Nate's point, it's very hard to write that down and stop that happening in law. Juniper, as you respond to this question of whether we should change our conception of free speech, if you could identify specific solutions that Google and YouTube are uh, thinking about that might be effective, that would be really helpful too. Yeah. So to Elliot's point, um, we as private companies are not bound by the First Amendment. And we all have developed community guidelines that set the rules of the road for our respective services. If those were local or state laws, they would not pass First Amendment scrutiny, most, most of them. Um, we, for example, have a policy on YouTube that prohibits hate speech. Hate speech is largely protected under the First Amendment in the US. You cross the line to you know, actually inciting violence, then you might be able to pass a law to reach that speech. Um, but for the most part, absolutely protected. That's something that we don't allow on the platform. So we're all, already going beyond um, where the US standards are. So I think it's a, a, a broad misconception that the approach we take to speech on our services is, is a reflection of where the US constitutional system draws the line on speech. Now that said, um, that obviously puts a lot of control in the hands of the company sitting, sitting here in terms of um, what kind of, of speech is allowed to um, have the global reach that our services and platforms provide. And that is a responsibility that we take very seriously. And so something that I think we owe to, to the public more and more to the public, to civil society, to governments that are interested in, in these questions is transparency. You know, Google issued the, the first transparency report many years ago on the kinds of requests we get from governments to remove speech because it's deemed illegal by the requester. Um, we thought that was an important thing to be uh, public about. And we just, um, last week actually, released the first transparency report for YouTube that shares aggregate data about how we enforce our own policies. How many flags do we get from users to look at content that might violate those policies? How many videos do we take down? We're going to start doing this on a quarterly basis. And we do it with the full understanding that that level of transparency 
creates accountability for us. People, of course, will pick apart what we've released. They will ask us questions. They will take issue with certain things. And they may put more pressure on us than we already have, which is hard to imagine because it's a lot of pressure um, already. Um, but we do think that kind of transparency and accountability is an important part of the role we play in regards to these questions. Now, um, with that framework in mind, that um, you know, the question of what speech exists on our platforms isn't really about um, what kind of speech is, is um, open to regulation under the First Amendment, because that's about what governments can do. Um, I do think the First Amendment is an interesting reference point for us, and I'm sure many of us who work at these companies do have debates around the kinds of speech that even in the US, and arguably the most speech protective country in the world, um, obviously some things are outside the scope of the First Amendment. And we, we do you know, look at that and study it closely. And um, I think I've talked to Jeff and maybe Larry before about um, you know, one of the cases that intrigues me, because it's an issue we have to deal with a lot on our platforms, is, the, is Brandenburg v. Ohio, where, um, it, which sets the standard for when speech essentially crosses the line to inciting violence and is no longer pure speech and, and ideas, but is actually trying to provoke action. And, and that case was um, decided by the US Supreme Court in 1969. So it's fairly old um, and essentially says that if, if the speaker intends to provoke imminent lawless action and there is a high likelihood that such action will ensue, then, um, then that is no longer protected speech and it can be regulated by the government. And I think there's a couple of things about that standard that don't carry over well to the digital age. It's, it's a very context-dependent standard, where the case was decided in the context of a KKK rally, where someone was saying a lot of racial slurs and kind of provoking violence, um, and was prosecuted in an Ohio statute that was deemed to be unconstitutional. Um, and some of the people in the crowd were armed. And there was a sense that, you know, according to Ohio, that maybe that action, that, that speech created a clear and present danger, I think was the prior standard. Um, and, the, and the court tightened that line to protect it even more speech than was protected before. But the problem with online speech is you have speech um, that is going out to an unknown audience. Um, and so evaluating whether someone saying, you know, go kill Americans is likely to provoke such action is really difficult. Whereas if this were a room full of pe armed anti-American organized, you know, group of folks, then, you know, obviously the immediacy of that threat would feel very, very different. So I do think in terms of when speech isn't just offensive or, you know, counterfactual or um, some of the things that I would argue we should, you know, continue to allow to exist, um, but when it actually crosses the line to potentially causing real world harms, that's something we grapple with deeply and that I don't think the current um, you know, line of jurisprudence on that question really relates fully to the way speech is now shared in the digital age. Um, I just wanted to respond to what Nate said about the way that we surface information and ranking algorithms, because um, it is another important piece of this puzzle. Obviously, we have content policies that set the rules of the road for what we want to allow on our platform at all. Um, we also have monetization policies, which um, is an even higher bar of what we, where we allow ads to run, um, which is a way of saying, OK, some speech is allowed to be out in the public square, but it's not something we want to enable people to make money off of or want to make money off of ourselves. Um, but then there are also ranking decisions. Now, ranking algorithms, obviously, you know, with the scale of the web that you know, it, Google search is trying to index the web as completely as possible, um, or the scale of YouTube, where we have well over 400 hours of video uploaded every minute, um, there has to be an organizing principle. right? You can't have information chaos. You could have an organizing principle like, we'll serve all the information on the web alphabetically. right? That would be completely useless to the end user. So you have to have an organizing principle that serves the needs of the users of your products. And so for us, um, that North Star on Google has always been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That is the mission of the company and what it aims to do. Um, on, on YouTube, we aim to give people a voice and show them the world. And of course, that's also underpinned by Google's core mission to you know, make information useful and accessible. And so um, when I talked earlier about quality and how sometimes in the middle, um, when we know people are looking for news in particular, we strive really hard 
hard to promote authoritative content and demote less authoritative content, that's not a value judgment on what is being said. There are plenty of things said by authoritative sources that um, many, many of us would disagree with. It's not a value judgment on the speech itself. It's trying to serve the end user's need to be able to trust our service, to serve them reliable and useful information. And so if someone is a less trusted source, they're less likely to help us fulfill that mission for the end user. Um, we do think of growth as you know, responsible growth at YouTube. We're not trying to pursue watch time above all other ends. Um, you know, we want people to trust the service long term. So we actually think it's critical to our business interest to deliver not just the you know, thing that people pick up in the dentist's office because they want to know if it really is an alien baby. We want to give people something that they subscribe to, that they want to read every week, you know, that they keep coming back to because they're getting something of value. It's enhancing their lives. And so that is the goal of how we think about ranking. So I, I do want to turn to questions. We have a few minutes. We're going to go a little long. Um, and But I want to reframe some of this just very briefly. Um, and I'll start with uh, a heuristic that I've used with my board that everyone up here has heard me use before, which is imagine it's 1964 and somebody comes to you and says, I have this great story. Lyndon Johnson is running a child trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor here in DC. I want to get this out. Now ask yourself, how would that have gotten out? And of course, the answer is it wouldn't. And you want to ask yourself, why wouldn't it and why does it today? And that, in a sense, is the problem that we're trying to grapple with. Now, but wait, 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 let me just finish this. Let me just finish this. <laughs> it wouldn't have, and it does today. It's as simple as that. I mean, I think those two facts are undeniable. Part of the reason that it wouldn't have is the traditional media all, all did serious curation for content. All of them, whether it was the producers of news like the New York Times, who were also distributors because they weren't just running their own stories, but they would take stories they got elsewhere. So they were both producers and distributors and the major TV networks, whether it was the newsstand guy on the corner who was deciding which magazines he was going to sell out of his thing. They were all making choices about what they would or wouldn't put out. And those choices tended to exclude a lot of this extremist stuff. There were some extremist outlets. It was If you went looking for it, you could go find it. The John Birch Society had a paper. The Communist News Party had a paper. They would probably run that story about Lyndon Johnson and do so happily. And their readers might have like been gratified to read it. But it wouldn't have reached the mass audience. What the technology has done, what the internet has done, is reduced the cost for an individual to produce that story. And the internet and then the companies themselves as further facilitators have made it possible to get to a mass audience. And then that itself has invited many more people to produce it. So the nature of the problem has somewhat changed. Now, the second point that's just worth noting is all of the people up here acknowledge that their companies are, in fact, already regulating for content, that they have no choice but to do so. So they're all doing it. But the sort of line is, you don't want us to go that step further to regulate, like to start screening out that stuff very much. And that, to me, is the question. And that's why the first question that we talked about, which is how serious is the threat to democracy that's going on, is so important. Because if you don't really think it's a threat, it's just like annoying and it's making our politics less good than it could be, then you might say, yeah, we really don't want you doing what news producers and distributors always did. Right, you've substituted for them, but you don't have to or you shouldn't do that. And in some ways, it's a weirder choice because they're so centralized. I, Elliot was, I gave a talk at Facebook to their policy team, and I said to them, this is not your fault, but it is your responsibility now because you have become such a powerful centralized hub for news distribution. So you can't ignore this problem. So the question, should they do more and can they do better? is the question that's really out on the table. And what we heard a lot is, I think, a fair amount of acknowledgment that maybe we didn't do this so well at first. Who saw this problem coming? And that we're all trying now. And there's a lot of steps being, and as Elliot says, I think it is a little premature to say all these efforts aren't sufficient. I think we do need, that's why we were so interested in the data and the research, and we'll be coming to all your other companies to get you guys to do it too, <laughs> um, is we do need a lot more research to understand this. But the question still needs to be asked now, because if the problem is serious enough, then we may need to think about something more fundamental than what we're doing now. And with that, let me open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, so my, or do we want to let I the audience? Want, just speak loud. No, no, you can yell. A live stream audience that can hear or uh, repeat. Uh, I kind of found myself wondering whether the First Amendment's not the only part of the Constitution that bears on this. Um, because we've kind of had an equation in our conversation between increased democracy over time from the framing to today and the easing of like, smaller Republican features in favor of 
all the democratic ones. But the, it seems like there's a lot of structural features built into the Constitution that are counter-majoritarian, not that democratic, and those might actually help uh, fake news and digital disinformation spread. My, my friend Ben, who's in my class, I don't know if he's here tonight, but Ben pointed out that the Electoral College is a great example of that. It's a classic counter-majoritarian feature of the Constitution. And it, if you wanted to influence an election with fake news, it gives you a literal map with which to do that. You can say, well, if I want to swing the election, I've got this very small number of states and these small number of counties, too. Um, so it, it, it seems to me like there's, the First Amendment's not, there may be some uh, counter-majoritarian features built into the Constitution that are actually helping uh, misinformation influence our democracy. And I guess you could add into that also, besides the electoral college, you could say, first past the post, winner take all, creates this sort of buy, like, um, what's the term Professor Chris Lee? Like a two-party duopoly. Um, a plus, <laughs> <laughs> or as we say here, <laughs> honors. Yeah. Uh, H. 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 With a book prize. Right. Sort of the affective, the two-party affective polarization that we were talking about at the beginning of this. So I don't know if people have any thoughts on that. I think that's Larry's uh, question to answer. Well, yeah, but but let I. Let's talk after. That no. is really long it's a really It's a great question, but it is one that. Yeah, uh, can I just say yeah. a, a, a twenty second on this, which is that we tend to naturally, given the forum here, think about US democracy. Uh, I actually think these problems of disinformation are uh, much smaller here than elsewhere. And so if you think about core questions of, of democracy, especially in places where some of these platforms are the only way that people uh, view the internet, that uh, rumors and viral deception and the like uh, have a much bigger impact on all these other uh, countries around the world, and, and even leading to death, right? You've seen some in the New York Times most recently on this. And so uh, that is, I think, unique to the way that uh, information is traveling in this new ecosystem. Could I, I just feel compelled? Can I say two things really quickly? I couldn't agree more with, I'm going to really strongly agree with, with Nate and really strongly disagree with Larry. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with Nate that the issue, that this battle is really interesting and dynamic here in this country. It's a very different battle in other parts of the world. Uh, if you think that fake news is a problem here, um, the, the problem in other countries that I lose sleep over is the, the hook of fake news being used as a means of regulating what's acceptable speech in countries that do not have either democratic traditions or traditions of the free press. And, and, the, and again, I, I don't want to sound too sort of uh, uh, histrionic about it, but the, 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 the debate here and the rhetoric here, I promise you, I promise you, fuels activities in other parts of the world to legitimate action that will deny people their, their ability to express themselves, to associate, et cetera. So we need to proceed. Another reason why we proceed need to proceed. Really yeah, though, Elliot, that cuts. The, I think that cuts, if anything, the opposite way. He gets to interrupt me. I don't get to interrupt. I just <laughs> want to. That's what happens when you're the moderator and the panelist. Right. I, I want to say, as the original moderator, we're going to have one or two more here. questions. But I want, before we do our final vote, a lightning round on what each of the three companies is doing now to combat the problem of digital disinformation. Gary, moderator. Um, so. Uh, uh, Russia um, uh, and his, his ability to respond to all of his disinformation or, uh, from all the major media sources. And, um, and if you look at the uh, media in the Middle East and much of the world where um, it, there is just, you just never can believe what is written. Um, we, uh, the U.S. is just recently entered into that phase. And my question is what this will do to the American psyche, American participation in democracy, and, um, you know, what are the impacts on the readers? Um, and, and then also, I really am interested in hearing what you guys plan to do with your platforms, because I think there's a lot that could be. <laughs> Can I just say on the empirics of this as to how, how uh, again, we don't really know the amount of disinformation out there, the share of disinformation of the total amount of information that you consume online, uh, or its electoral effects. We have some hypotheses, and uh, as my colleague Josh Tucker from NYU often uh, says, who's here, um, the thing about the internet 
is that you can find millions of examples of anything, right? And so if it's fake news or if it's uh, uh, incendiary content, and, and not only that, you can find it really quickly because you can search on her platform or the, her, the, the, the parent platform for YouTube, right? And so, uh, and so there's, there's a challenge here in trying to figure out what this incredible magnitude of phenomena means in, in the real world. Uh, that's what we're, we're trying to do with this, this project. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the answer is going to be very complicated. Okay, we're going to realize that disinformation, however we define it, has certain effects on certain types of people, right? Um, in certain contexts, um, and one thing you're going to you're going to find out is that some of these criticisms actually contradict each other. The notion of echo chambers and the idea of the effect of disinformation are actually in tension yeah. with each other, because if it's true that we were living in echo chambers, then you wouldn't worry that a story about how the Pope endorses Donald Trump is actually having an electoral effect by persuading Democrats to vote for him, right? It's that, that these, these phenomena are extremely complicated and dynamic, right? Not only because the platforms are experimenting all the time, but uh, the actors who are relevant are changing their tactics on a daily basis. Let's, uh, in the spirit of delivering on what we promised, let me ask uh, Nick, Juniper, and then Elliot, what... Uh, uh, Twitter is doing, Nick, to combat the problem of digital disinformation. So just to do that really awkward lawyer British thing where I'm going to say I'm going to come back to that point and then come to that point. <laughs> okay, uh, but gonna, you have to answer it. So I think, so Peter's book is phenomenal. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. The one thing I would say that's different and that isn't present is the role of civilians and the citizenry as willing participants in the process that Peter describes. And I don't think that's the case here. I think the um, the fundamentals around civic participation, um, the fundamentals around due process, you know, the fundamentals around people being allowed to stand for elections, that are, all of those in that book exist in a kind of theatrical way. They're not meaningful in substance, but people go along with it, and that's the hypothesis behind the book. I don't think that's the case in the United States as someone who is hoping, to, well, will be spending a lot more time here, but um, for, from now I've just been observing from afar. Um, and the point on the Constitution, I would say, one of the, looking down the path, the things that we'll all be asked to do next is, if you look at somewhere like India, a lot of this information is being shared peer-to-peer, -peer, not over um, surface web. So as a result, the, the interventions as a company versus privacy are very, very different to doing something that's at a surface layer. So actually, the, the responses as companies come up with different, uh, different issues there. And certainly something that we're struggling with is, in the US, there's two parties. Uh, in the current Brazilian election, there's 35, uh, which makes a lot of things that work in the US very, very different when you try and apply them to other countries. So in terms of, of what we're doing, um, I mentioned firstly, we're, we're clamping down significantly on the number of automated accounts, um, both in terms of limiting their activity, but also limiting their visibility of impact. So a small change you may have seen is that when you see tweets embedded on news sites now, you don't get the old raw number of retweets, number of likes. You get a different metric, which is how many people are talking about something, which changes the incentives. Um, we're being much more aggressive on challenging accounts that we think exhibit behavior that resembles malicious automation. Um, you will see some of that, uh, and people get caught by this because they maybe tweet very high volumes, and people will cry, oh, this is being motivated by what I'm tweeting when actually they've been caught by automated systems because of the volume and the way that they're tweeting, perhaps they're using automated tools. Um, we've massively reduced the ability of third-party applications and removed hundreds of thousands of them from our API. Um, that's the same API that's used by a lot of academics already, I would add. Um, in terms of academic research, there's certainly plenty that's been done on Twitter, and we've learned a lot from that. That's a big part of our, our looking forward. Um, some of you may have seen we posted a call for papers uh, in April. We've had more than 230 applications. Um, I've read a chunk of them. There's some really amazing submissions in there from around the world with some really creative ways of both analyzing the problem and actually looking at solving the problem. So um, we're definitely looking at that as being an opportunity to try new things uh, with outside people. And then making sure that the, the parts of the platform that we control, we're emphasizing credibility and authenticity. So uh, that's things like working with the Credibility Coalition and the Trust Project to understand how we can use their signals at scale in machine-readable format. And then finally, um, our Ads Transparency Center, which is 
going to be live for the midterms, which is talking about, again, the funding sources of political adverts. And that will eventually roll out globally. So there's a mix of activities there, but it's, it's about stopping the things that we know are happening now, improving the health of Twitter more broadly, and then making sure that users have enough transparent information that they know why they're seeing what they're seeing. And we also have kept the off switch. So if you actually want the reverse chronological Twitter with no filtering, you can still have it. <laughs> Juniper, what are Google and YouTube doing to combat the problem of digital disinformation? Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I think it's important to start with the investment we're making in security and in fighting spam across our services, because this is really where we get at the most egregious side of this problem, which is we invest a ton of resources, have a huge security team that is protecting our services from foreign interference, and also is, you know have complex technological systems to catch spams and bot networks and fake accounts and those kinds of things so that we can take them down very quickly because those are the, often the vehicles for spreading misinformation at scale. So that's a really important part of the, the picture. Um, then I talked earlier about making sure that we're promoting authoritative content and, and demoting lower quality content. That's a complex picture as well where obviously we want to make sure that content that violates our policies isn't there in the first place and then that we're able to identify content that maybe shouldn't rank as highly and promoting authoritative content. On the authoritative content piece, I want to talk about something that we haven't talked about a lot on this panel today, which is um, investing in, in news and publishing. So a huge part of our effort here, obviously, when you talk about people coming to YouTube or search, um, it's not just about making sure they're not exposed to information that's not trustworthy, but it's also that there's good information on news topics available and being produced in a way that we can promote those sources. So through the Digital News Initiative, we've been invested tens of millions of dollars, we're very focused on Europe, um, to making sure that we're giving news um, sources the, the tools, the technological tools they need um, to make sure that their content is available and also that we're <coughs> investing in them and, and making sure their content is, is visible on the service. And then on the transparency front, um, we think it is really important. Part of this is what contributions we can make to an informed citizen, citizenry, to having people who have the skills to discern truth from, from fact, because that is going to be a persistent need no matter what society you live in and what moment in time. And so um, we've tried various things on that front. Obviously, there's been a lot of investment in kind of the, the fact-checking um, world and experimentation with that. One thing that we did on YouTube um, is we knew there was a lot of concern about news sources that were funded by governments. And so we created a transparency label where underneath the video watch page of, um, of the RT, but also of you know, um, PBS, uh, it says that this, um, for RT, this um, channel receives funding in whole or part from the Russian government. If it's a public broadcaster, it notes that it's a public broadcaster because there is some distinction in terms of the financial structures there. But we disclose both of those things and we link to a Wikipedia page that allows people to get even more detail about exactly who the source is. So that's a, um, an important piece of transparency we offer, but also a subtle reminder that people should check their sources when they're consuming information online. Um, the final thing I want to say is picking up on, on something from Nate, which is you know, the, the first part, the first step in solving a problem is understanding and scoping it. And so um, really investing in the research community. We you know, give a, a large grant to the Belfer Center and invest in, in others and have partnerships with those who are doing research to really understand the nature, the effect, and the scope of the problem so that we can develop the right solutions um, to target the issue, not as it exists in the public imagination, but as it actually exists backed by data. So that's another important piece of the investment we're making. And then there's a whole work stream around um, election protection, which has a lot of components to it that we could get into on another day. Wonderful. Elliot, uh, last word to you, and then Larry will sum up, and then we'll vote. What is Facebook doing to combat the problem of digital so, disinformation? So the good news is that the themes are pretty much, you know, are much common across the industry. Um, I, again, I gave my categories because I got to be last. I get to add a couple more categories. We want to remove content that's wrong, that's, that, that, that doesn't belong on our platform, either because, as, as I said, it violates our standards or um, because the motivations are improper and inappropriate. So with, with the community standards, we take it down. If it's spam or essentially the political equivalent of spam, 
uh, information that's designed to generate an economic return not be accurate or informed. We take it down. Reduce. Uh, we reduce the distribution of content as a result of user reports, fact checker uh, 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 reports, or other signals that we're able to get that content is either misinformation uh, or, or inaccurate. Um, once a story, for example, is rated as false, its distribution is reduced so that the number of future views goes down by almost 80%. We are building greater capacity to take down and, and reduce the distribution of this content. Um, uh, uh, research. Uh, uh, Juniper mentioned that. I mentioned it before. I think there's an awful lot more we can do to understand the role this, this uh, 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 threat plays and, and help us develop better responses. Regulate. Both Twitter and we have come out in favor of the Honest Ads Act. You know, just because we're private companies doesn't mean we don't benefit if there's an appropriate regulatory climate. If advertisers are required to disclose and provide us information, it reinforces the efforts we're making on our own. All of us are, to varying degrees, promoting transparency in our advertising, and it would be easier and better if the government, if the U.S. government, would require that across all platforms, not just online. I hope that will happen. All of us are not waiting. We are proceeding regardless, so it will happen on our platforms. Uh, in, uh, inform. I think we need to help people make better decisions. It may be that good, inf good content, good speech doesn't drive out bad, but that doesn't mean we can't encourage more good speech. So we, too, have, an, have programs designed to increase the distribution of sources that are trusted, to provide more content uh, that, that uh, uh, gives people context and promotes common understanding, uh, and, and are partnering more with organizations that promote news literacy so that people are able to make better, more critical, exercise better critical judgment in the decisions they make. And then the last thing, and you can see it reflected even here to some extent on the panel, and that is collaborate. No one company is going to solve this problem. I think the industry has learned a tremendous amount of what's, from what's happened over the past couple of years, and the lines of communication to identify threats, to work together on solutions, and to find ways to make sure that we do a better job creating an informed and understanding public is on us, and I think you're seeing the industry come together about that. Uh, Larry, last word. Uh, not so much the last word. I want to sort of tie this up, and again, with a question, and by coming back to the Constitution. Um, you can't ha the Constitution is, in some sense, based on the notion that you can have too much of a good thing. And the uh, two things would be democracy and liberty. And of course, the Constitution is meant to promote both, but it promotes both by recognizing that if you have too much of either, you will lose them. And the, what's been interesting about the development of the internet and what it's done is it has been a radically democratizing force that has created, as, as, as Juniper said, a radical democratization of access to speech and in that sense to liberty. When the founders talked about liberty, they actually talked about well-regulated liberty. And that reflected that notion that you actually needed a certain amount of regulation in order to protect liberty from itself. And the question that we're really, again, faced with here is something has happened, which is the technology came along that has created a possibility that just never existed in the past. And certain economic forces have conspired to put a small number of private companies with massive control as, as the central outlets for the way in which it's being used by people. And the question we need to be thinking about as a society, and I don't have a view on it, whether it should be government, whether the companies are doing an adequate job, whether we can trust them. I mean, these are great speakers. I believe they mean everything they say. The question, of course, is they are still representatives of private companies that have fiduciary and other responsibilities that affect the way in which they're going to think about these things. Are those the right things? Are they producing the right results? Those are the questions that are really on the table. The only piece that I'm very insistent on is that we not understate the nature and extent of the threat and so be open to the kinds of thinking that may be necessary in order to deal with it adequately. With that, thank you all very much for being here. And, and Jeffrey wants to finish. Yes, I, I, we have to have the final vote. Final and I'll just say that the questions that Larry has posed and that the panelists have answered so well are precisely the ones that the National Constitution Center was founded to convene. This is what I hope will be a series of conversations about the future of Madisonian democracy. For those of you who are meeting the Constitution Center for the first time, please continue to follow us on the web. Check out our weekly We the People podcast. Join us in our crucially important civic mission of bringing together citizens of different perspectives to unite around this 
document that uh, unites us, which is the U.S. Constitution. And with that, it's time for our final vote. Check back in with yourselves very deeply. Consider whether you've changed your mind in light of this remarkable discussion. And please, by raising your hands, because I don't even want to try the clickers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the clickers are working? All right, well, use the clickers, and then we can raise our hands to find out the answer. Uh, do you believe that dig is digital disinformation undermining democracy? Please vote yes or no, and record your votes. One of us falls through a trap door. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do it by hand, too. And we're definitely going to do it by hand, because technology sometimes fails. Well, they must have done it by hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Said, yes, it is. How many times can we vote? <laughs> 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 right, thank you so much for voting. And as the results are being t uh, 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 tabulated, let's have a show of hands. Who <laughs> believes that digital disinformation is undermining democracy? Who believes that it is not? But Who changed his or her mind based on the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> and whose mind was open to the arguments on the other side? There we go. That is the goal of the National Constitution <laughs> Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists. I have to be wrong. 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 I have to Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.